timely subject, Do Not Take Up Jehovah's Name in Vain. Brother David Martin, our district overseer, will discuss this subject with us. Brother Martin, please. As we've learned today, it's a great honor to bear Jehovah's name. But there's been people that have done that before that weren't successful in doing so. As a matter of fact, you go back in your Bible reading, you'll find that the Israelite nation was an honor for them to be called by Jehovah's name. As a matter of fact, this whole nation was taken as a special people to him, as the book of Exodus chapter 19 says. But you'll learn that because of that, Jehovah choosing them as a chosen nation, carrying his name, they had the responsibility to live up to that ability to carry his name, to live up to Jehovah's standards. Friends, it's the same way today. There's a Bible principle I'd like to share with you about that in Psalm 97 and verse 10 that will help us to understand here in our discussion about why we do not want to take up Jehovah's name in vain. Look at what the psalmist mentioned here in Psalm 97, and particularly in the 10th verse. Psalm 97, verse 10. It says, O you lovers of Jehovah, hate what is bad. He is guarding the souls of his loyal ones. Out of the hand of the wicked ones he delivers them. That's something that the nation of Israel failed to appreciate. As a matter of fact, there you notice the psalmist said that lovers of Jehovah would be ones that he would guard because of their loyalty. They would be loyal to Jehovah. And that out of the hand of the wicked ones, he would deliver them. But what happened to the nation of Israel? They proved disloyal. And then Jehovah transferred his favor from the literal nation of Israel to what Galatians later talked about as spiritual Israel, these of the anointed that Jehovah God would choose, this spiritual Israel that has a special responsibility to bear Jehovah's name. Even today, that is the ones that take the lead in the announcing of Jehovah's name and kingdom, those that are anointed by Jehovah through his Holy Spirit. But there are other sheep that the Bible talked about that would come. And no doubt most, if not all here, can or are part of that crowd of other sheep that also bear Jehovah God's name. But we need to know, what does it mean to take Jehovah's name in vain? Well, let's go back to the Mosaic Law, and we'll find out where this term even began to be discussed. In the book of Exodus, chapter 20, this is the law that was given through Moses to the nation of Israel. Now, you'll notice here in the 20th chapter of the book of Exodus, we'll have penned for us what has come to be called the Ten Commandments contained within that law. Now, the third commandment is contained there in chapter 20 of Exodus and verse 7. It was a warning to the nation of Israel. Notice what it says there. Exodus 20, verse 7. You must not take up the name of Jehovah your God in a worthless way. For Jehovah will not leave the one unpunished who takes up his name in a worthless way. It's interesting, that third commandment is in its proper and logical sequence declared that we must not take up the name of Jehovah in a worthless way. Now he had talked about before him being the only God, not making any images like him or bowing down to them. But then in that third commandment, He talked about not taking up that name in vain. Now that harmonizes with what we find in the scriptures, particularly the prominence attached to the Jewish uh, name throughout the Hebrew scriptures. You'll find that there are 6,973 times that that name Jehovah was contained in what we now know as the Hebrew scriptures. That is the books of, of Genesis through Malachi. Now, That name occurs just eight times in those ten words, but over 6,973 times that name Jehovah is taken, and it tells us that we should not treat that name in a worthless way, that is to lift up that name to falsehood or in any kind of vanity against it. The Israelites should have known that. That was part of the law that was given to them. They were privileged to bear Jehovah's name as his witnesses. 
But you know, the Jewish tradition of that time promoted a different line of thinking. It promoted an extreme view of this commandment. To prevent accidental blasphemy, these Jewish religious leaders forbade the pronouncing of that divine name. They told them, do not use that name. It's too holy. And yet, that drastic step did not provide the nation's relationship with Jehovah because it actually went right against the direction that Jehovah had given them through the nation of Israel and the Mosaic Law. Now, some today believe that this commandment we just read there in Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, refers primarily to profanity or to speaking disrespectfully of Jehovah. And, of course, that's something we'd never want to do anyway, that is to be irreverent toward God, as some people do today, using the term God or Lord simply to add emphasis to their bad speech or as a substitute for a curse word. We don't do that. But it's interesting that command that we just read there in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 7 refers to something more, namely to the conduct of those that would bear the name. You see, those representing Jehovah today, as it was back then, must avoid doing anything that discredits that name, Jehovah God. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't use that name. There's nothing in the scriptures that say that his name should not be used. But Moses, who used uh, that name vividly, and he was used to record that command in the Bible, understood that God's name should be used. As a matter of fact, that name is mentioned many hundreds of times in the Pentateuch, that is the first five books of the Bible that were written by the man Moses. You see, rather what it means is that the servants of Jehovah do not do things that discredit that name. That's what the commandment was from God himself. Now the Israelites taking it the wrong way, what happened? Well, they stopped using that name. They also stopped worshiping Jehovah the way that he desired them to do. And those Israelites later became idolaters, fornicators, and murmurers. Now, because of their debased worship while claiming to serve Jehovah, these ones who originally had started out as his chosen people actually became apostates. They, by their actions and words, turned away from Jehovah God in clean worship. Apostasy began to bring reproach on Jehovah's name very, very quickly. And as a matter of fact, it got so bad that Jehovah had to do something about it. The Bible record tells about the first recorded instance of apostasy in the book of Leviticus. It talks about a man that was of a mixed parentage who was in struggle with an Israelite man, and it says he began to abuse the name of God and to call down evil upon it. Now, when you read that account in the book of Leviticus, it says that Jehovah decreed the penalty of death by stoning that offender, and thereby he established the due punishment for any future abusers of Jehovah's name. You see, Jehovah, the God of justice, could not leave these hypocrites unpunished. This nation of Israel that had left him, that had used his name in vain. And so the Bible account says that he allowed the Babylonians to come and take them captive as their captivity was done in Babylon later. You see, those Jews as a group not only were disdained by Jehovah at that time, but later this same national group rejected even the Messiah, the Son of God himself. And that's why that kingdom of God was taken from them and given to this spiritual nation whose conduct honored Jehovah, that used that name not in vain. Friends, this is an example of the Israelites that carries a strong warning for you and me. Open your Bible with, you, with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, centuries later, Paul, inspired by Jehovah God, writes these words to the congregation there in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and please notice the 11th verse. First Corinthians 10 verse 11. Now these things went on befalling them as examples, and they were written for a warning to us upon whom the ends of the system of things have arrived. Now Paul was writing to a group of... Uh, Christians in the first century that were looking at the end of a system. 
that occurred in the year 70 CE. But today those words have more meaning for us. We're living at the end of a system when this will be even more true. To go back and look at the ancient example of those ones who took Jehovah's name in vain and dishonored him and what happened to them. You see, today, unlike the Israelites, Jehovah's servants today as a group will not lose Jehovah's favor. He's told us that that would be the case. And as a matter of fact, today, uh, we see millions now recognizing that God is with this anointed group of Christians, and many have begun to join his organization. Uh, This morning, we saw some that took that step. You see, Jehovah had said that he would call a people for his name. And that's one important way to honor Jehovah is by showing proper respect for that name, as we talked about before. Remember, Micah said that we walk in the name of Jehovah by striving to live each day in a way that reflects well on that name that we bear. So as individuals bearing Jehovah's name today, we have to live up to his righteous standards in order to remain in his favor. None of us. Not one individual has a surefire ticket into the new system. We will have to honor that name and be loyal to our God through the end of this system of things. So that's why we have to think about what we're doing, what we're saying. We have to keep that high standard of conduct, of honesty, physical and moral cleanliness. And it's not easy, is it? As we sit here in this group this morning in the year 2011, it's going to require strenuous effort for us to remain loyal to Jehovah and uphold his righteous standards. There is no doubt. And the reason is because we have three factors that are against us. We have Satan the devil that does not want us to have happiness or life now or in the future. We have the world around us that wants to do their things their way. Don't tell me anything. And you should come and join us because we're having a lot of fun. And thirdly, our self can be an enemy to us if we're not careful. The imperfect flesh will cry out to do what we want to do. But notice what Jehovah has penned for us so that we can understand why making good choices and not taking up Jehovah's name in vain will be a produce for any of us, families and individuals alike. Turn in your Bible to the book of Romans chapter 12 with me. The Apostle Paul here was talking to a group of Christians in the city of Rome in the first century, and he was giving them some direction that would be very good for us today. Even though it was written almost 2,000 years ago, notice what Paul wrote through the direction of Jehovah God himself about the choices and decisions that we will all make. Here in Romans chapter 12, notice verse 2 first of all. He said, And quit being fashioned after this system of things. But be transformed by making your mind over that you may prove to yourselves the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now notice verse 9. Here's the actions that it will take. Let your love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is wicked. Cling to what is good. You see, that word abhor is very strong. It's not just hate. It means to detest utterly. It means that anything that goes against Jehovah should make us sick at our stomach. And that's how we have to view the things of this world that are out of harmony with his will and purpose. We cannot choose to do what others in this world are doing in regard to their own choices out of harmony with God. Now, the Apostle Paul later, if you remember, on the Isle of Patmos, wrote there some words that would help us too. Go back to 1 John chapter 2. And let's notice verses 15 through 17. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Now here he enumerates something that we want to stay away from, and then he gives us the reason why. 1 John chapter 2, let's read 15, verse 15 through 17 together. He says, Do not be loving either the world or the things in the world, If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him, because everything in the world, the desire of the flesh and the desire of the eyes, the showy display of one's means of life, does not originate with the Father, but originates with the world. 
Now notice what he said would make the difference in our life in the future. He said, furthermore, the world is passing away and so is its desire. But he that does the will of God remains forever. You see why it's important for us to contemplate our decisions and as a people for his name to reject the poison of this world and apostates that tell us that we should do what they're doing? See, apostasy is an a turning away from Jehovah's true word, and it's a direct affront to Jehovah's name. Now, some apostates, those who speak against God's name and want us to follow them, they may claim to know and serve God, but you find that they reject certain Bible teachings and requirements. Others reject his organization. But you'll find that by their conduct, it shows that they've taken up God's name in a worthless way. We don't have to look far to see that they're not doing Jehovah's will. As a matter of fact, they're doing their own will, which puts them on the side of the adversary, Satan the devil. Friends, don't ever become curious about those making themselves God's enemies. They may say they're having lots of fun, but we should really feel a loathing for what they do because it's out of harmony with the God that we worship. See, that's a ploy of Satan the devil. Satan the devil is an adversary not only to God, but to each one of us. And he's long used these apostates or these individuals that desire to do their own thing to seduce God's servants to do what they're doing. They claim to worship God, believe the Bible maybe, but they reject the things that show that they're not on Jehovah's side in this issue. You see, what they want, they're not content to just leave the faith that they perhaps termed as true before. Often they want to take others with them. So rather than going out and making their own disciples, those apostates seek to do, as Acts says, to draw away the disciples, that is, Christ's disciples, after them. They don't want you to worship the true God. They want you to come and take their course of rebellion against Jehovah. They use distortions, half-truths, outright falsehoods. And those malicious opposers would tell what is not true with the intent to deceive others. We have to be on guard against that. In this world, there are many of that way. There are some that knew Jehovah and they left him. There are others that don't know him and they don't want to serve him. But remember, we avoid these ones by steering clear of their reasoning. We don't listen to them in person in printed form, on the internet, on television, in any way do we even expose ourselves to their bad thinking. The reason why? Jehovah God directs us to do that. He wants us to trust that He always has our best interest at heart. One of my favorite scriptures in Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17 and 18 shows that that's the case. Will you turn there with me to Isaiah 48? Here is Jehovah God himself speaking to you and me about what he desires for us. Notice how the prophet Isaiah writes it. Isaiah 48, verse 17 and 18. Now visualize, and it's true, this is what Jehovah is saying to you and me right now. Isaiah 48, 17. This is what Jehovah has said, your repurchaser, the Holy One of Israel. I, Jehovah, am your God, the one teaching you to benefit yourself, the one causing you to tread in the way in which you should walk. Oh, if only you would actually pay attention to my commandments, then your peace would become just like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Jehovah desires us to be successful. He'll teach us, he'll lead us in the right way, but we have to listen. And that's one reason why we don't listen to apostates. The second reason is we love the organization that has taught us, taught us these precious truths about Jehovah God. There is no one in the world that has helped us more than Jehovah through his organization to come to know the truth from the Bible. And so we don't want to be disloyal. We want to be loyal Christians, content to wait on Jehovah for what will happen in the future. Meanwhile, we see the clear evidence of his blessing upon Jehovah's organization. And friends, since we bear that name, Jehovah, we have to maintain a modest view of our own name and reputation. You see, we should not use our own standards to begin to judge Jehovah or others. 
As the Creator, Jehovah has the right to set the standard for what is good and what is bad, what's right and what is wrong. But we could begin to develop what was spoken of by one of the speakers on our theocratic ministry school this morning, and that is not seeking Jehovah's righteousness, but seeking our own. How that goes against the teachings of the Bible and Jehovah's direction. Even Jesus' own son, Jesus, the Son of God, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, said to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added to you. There's the key. See, it's important for us to recognize that if we don't do that, we begin to fall into a trap or a danger of becoming self-righteous ourselves. We begin to think that we're the best thing since sliced bread. And we're not. But see, we could think that. The person that becomes righteous over much begins to set his own standards for what's right and what's wrong. And then he begins to judge other people by those same things. But see, we don't have that right to do that. We have to remember that when things come up, we may not understand them. But we wait on Jehovah. Because one thing to remember is we don't always have all the facts about things. Jehovah sees it all. He knows what the resolution to these problems are. We don't. So we don't use our righteousness to try to solve our problems. We look to what Jehovah says. We don't impute our viewpoint on others. And the reason? Because our viewpoint can be distorted or limited. We're human. We sin. We can't make decisions for other people. And sometimes we can't understand why things happen the way they do. So if at times if we see something that we feel is unfair... Maybe it's what one of the brothers or sisters said or did. Or maybe it's something we feel is unfair on Jehovah's part. Maybe we read it in a Bible account or we experience in our personal life. Do not fall victim to taking Jehovah's name in vain and thinking that Jehovah caused that or will allow it to go on. Rather, let us leave that to Jehovah to judge what should be done. Not do it by our own standards, but wait on Jehovah. Look for his clear direction. See, that's what will delineate us from the world around us. Today in the modern world, and we've heard much of this through the writings of the faithful slave in some of our publications even, about the world today and how they seek secular education or what's called higher education. Well, that's what they're choosing to do and that's their prerogative. But see, pursuing secular goals or higher education today may indicate an inordinate love for our name for the reasons why we want to do it. You see, today in the world in which we live, higher education is viewed as vital to success. They'll tell you if you get a parchment to hang on your wall that says that you graduated from this term of higher learning, that you will be just so happy for the rest of your life you won't know how to handle it. But that's a big fat lie. That's not true. So what we want to do is many today realize that when they pursue an education in higher learning, many times they end up with their minds filled with harmful propaganda. You see them go away to colleges. You see them take on the philosophies of men. And before long, they begin thinking all about themselves and not about Jehovah at all. Now, we're not saying education is not important. It is. But this higher education that waste valuable youthful years that could be used in Jehovah's service or that takes us away from Jehovah's organization can be very detrimental to an individual. It can be death-dealing spiritually. You know, surprising, it's not surprising, rather, that in lands where many have received or have had the goal of higher education, in those lands what they have seen is that the belief in God is at an all-time low. Because now they focused all of their attention on themselves and gaining what they want to, doing exactly what John said we shouldn't, and that is to take part in this world and its thinking. Rather than looking at the advanced educational systems of this world for security, what we learn is we learn to trust in Jehovah. Maybe a vocational training, maybe an apprenticeship. Maybe a learning for a while, but then getting to take care of our families without taking this step of higher education. One brother I was talking to years ago said that he quit college to get a higher education. It's a true statement, isn't it? 
Divine education will always be higher education than anything mankind could ever give us. And we have many instances of that in the organization. I was reading one about Sherry, who gained strength from having a close relationship with Jehovah. In high school, the account says that she won awards because she did well academically. When she finished school, she was offered a scholarship that would enable her to pursue higher education. Now, Cherie said this, and let me quote her words. She said the offer was very tempting. And fellow students and teachers put a lot of pressure on me to accept it. But she realized that pursuing further education would require her to devote most of her time to studying and preparing for tests and those type of things with little time left for serving Jehovah. What do you think Cherie did? Well, let me quote what she says. After praying to Jehovah, I declined the scholarship, and I began serving as a regular pioneer. Now, in the meantime, as we sit here today, she has been pioneering for many, many years. And this is what she said in conclusion. I don't have any regrets. Knowing that I made a decision that pleases Jehovah makes me happy. Really, if you put God's kingdom first, all these other things will be added to you, unquote. She recognized Jesus' words were true. Parents, help your children to build their love for the privilege of bearing Jehovah's name. Our young ones will have to serve Jehovah with their heart. We have to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, as Jehovah told us through the words of Jesus there at Matthew 6.33. So as families and family members, may we look to do that ourselves. May we instill the privilege of bearing Jehovah's name in everything that we do as individuals and families. But it's not going to be easy. As a matter of fact, we wanted to discuss today, just for a couple of moments, why every one of us here today must guard against dishonoring Jehovah. There's a couple of things we'll mention to you that can be a distraction and can even lead to destruction. The first one we've mentioned many times, we'll do it one more, and that is the snare of materialism. Materialism and anxiety over making a living are affecting many people today in our Christian congregations. You see, the reason why that's happening is Satan the devil uses this lure of materialism to entrap a person. It doesn't mean that that person doesn't love Jehovah. But look how he acts. The commercial system of this world often promotes these get-rich-quick schemes that may even beguile some of Jehovah's people. At times, individuals may be urged to work hard, and when you reach a comfortable position, you can take it easy and you can enjoy life. Maybe you can even pioneer. But those words may be the unbalanced reasoning of some who take financial advantage of others or who have taken that course themselves and are lacking in spirituality. Think carefully about that incentive to go out and work hard to get more things. I'm reminded of that parable that Jesus gave at Luke chapter 12. Do you remember about the unreasonable rich man of Jesus' parable? It wasn't the pro problem that he had things. As a matter of fact, the parable says that his produce produced, he had many crops, he had storehouses, and he said, what will I do with all these things? He said, I think I know what I'll do. I'll build more. I'll have more things. And then God reasoned with him as an unreasonable man, what will all that hard work do when you die and you don't have a good name with God? See, that's what we have to think about ourselves. Satan operates this wicked system of things to induce people to desire things. It's not just the young ones. Any of us can fall victim to that. It can make inroads into a Christian's life, choking out the word and make it unfruitful. And sadly, during times that we've gone through recently, during hard economic times, some have sacrificed their spirituality in order to maintain the standard of living to which they've grown accustomed or one that they wish to attain. More work, more things, more valuable things. It reminds me of how to catch a monkey. Do you know how to catch a monkey? Hang with me, this is good. If you go to a place in the world today where there are wild monkeys, you know how they catch them? They'll find a log that's laying on the ground or a tree. They'll burrow out a hole just big enough for the monkey to get his hand in the hole. 
Now what they'll do is they'll put something in that hole, whether it be peanuts or something shiny, that will get their attention. Now here comes the little monkey. He sees the things inside that hole. He shoves his hand in and he grabs all he can grab and he can't get his hand out of the hole. Hard as he tries, he'll stay there day and night until someone comes to trap him or beat him to death. He will not let loose, which would allow him to extract his hand. You know what the lesson is for you and me? Don't let the world make a monkey out of us. Don't allow things that we want to have be such a draw that we will give up our relationship with Jehovah for those very things. Now, we may sit here and say, that will never happen to me. But, friends, it can. There was an article years ago that I'm reminded of of a brother that was offered a million dollars, and what he had to do is go away to where he couldn't worship Jehovah for a year, he'd get a million dollars. He refused. But you know there are people today that will leave Jehovah and lose their spirituality over a 50 cent an hour raise. Think about it. Our leaning and our thinking could lead us to become so materialistic that we worship not God but the things that we gain. It can be a detriment to us. The second thing we want to mention to you is excessive entertainment can lead someone to dishonor Jehovah. We have to avoid entertainment that promotes that thinking of materialism that we just talked about, or things like the occult. Much today is about the occult or spiritism. Have you seen recently, even on the television programs, how many of the programs are slanted towards spiritistic things? That is nothing that is by chance. Satan's wicked world is planning it that way. We even see parents that are instructed and and offered the opportunity to buy books for their children that are openly demonic. You know the ones I'm talking about. We have to be very careful. Those publications, whether they be television or reading material, the ones that feature violence and bloodshed and death, We have to recognize that we must stay away from those. The psalmist said that we would not set any one of our eyes any good-for-nothing thing. And yet entertainment will draw us to do just the opposite. You Christian parents particularly have a responsibility before Jehovah to be selective about what you allow to be viewed in your home. I was talking to someone about this not too long ago. You may remember a few years ago when there were two men in the city of Washington, D.C. that killed rampantly many people. They couldn't find them for a long time, and they were just popping them off, dead. Those men, when they found them, were found to use the media of the gaming to train them to kill people without feeling anything about it. Entertainment has a bearing upon people and their thinking. No true Christian would deliberately involve himself in spiritism or any of these things that Jehovah hates. We need to be aware of those films and TV series and video games, even comics and children's books that begin to show these attitudes that are directly against what Jehovah says he would bless. So whether we're young or old, our eyes should find no pleasure in these things. Video games that feature violence and depict killing with gory reality. Now, that's not my viewpoint. That's Jehovah's. Let me show you what I mean. Turn to Psalms 11, verse 5, if you will. You young ones particularly, as you have choices to make there with your parents' help, remember this scripture. It will show you the thinking of Jehovah as we make our choices and decisions. Even adults, as we watch the TV series that sometimes lead to great violence, Notice the words of Psalm 11, verse 5. It says, Jehovah himself examines the righteous one as well as the wicked one, and anyone loving violence his soul certainly hates. That's pretty graphic, isn't it? You can read any translation of the Bible, it says the same thing. Jehovah hates violence. Why would we want to have that in our homes or in any way set it before our eyes? See, we have to refuse to focus our mind on anything that Jehovah condemns. Remember, Satan is targeting our thoughts. Now, there's one thing that I appreciate about the Bible and Jehovah God himself in relation to Satan. Satan cannot read our minds. Aren't we glad for that? But you know what he can read? He can read our actions. He sees what we're doing. He's seeing the choices that we make. 
So we have to be very careful about those. It could lead Satan to bring temptations upon us further, to allow us to do things, to continue to do those and think it's okay. Even spending time viewing entertainment that's acceptable. If we find that it begins to encroach on our personal study, our family worship, or our preparation for meetings, we would do away with it completely. The Apostle Paul, writing to the congregation in Philippi, said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 9 and 10, Make sure of the more important things. Friends, the more important things today is making sure that we never take up Jehovah's name unworthily. That we always represent him in a way that's pleasing. Jehovah God deserves all the praise and honor that comes to him as the creator, as the one that knows us and loves us the best. And because we represent Jehovah today, our conduct truly does matter. You young ones, when you think about what you do, think about it's not just your parents that are training you in the right way. It's Jehovah God that wants you to conduct yourself well. And what we say and can do can either help to sanctify Jehovah's name that we have taken up or it can show it to be in a worthless way that we're using that name. Friends, be determined to take up his name in a worthy way because we will find that we can glorify God by our good conduct. Paul reminded the Christians in the first century of Corinth about the very same thing. Open your Bible with me to our final scripture. Actually, it's not. The second to our final scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. First Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31. Here's what we want to remember. Therefore, whether you are eating or drinking or doing anything else, do all things for God's glory. You see how that focus will help us? When the world tries to influence your thinking and actions, contemplate what that means. Ask yourself, where will this type of thinking or this action lead me? Because every line of thinking will have an action. Be careful about the decisions that we choose. You see, this circuit assembly program has given us some vital reminders about our conduct, the way we present ourselves, the things we do, and the things that we don't do. But see, with Jehovah's help, we can represent Him in a worthy way, and we can bring glory to Him, not just now, but forever. And that's a promise from the Creator. Notice Psalm 86 with me, verse 11 and 12, and this will be the last scripture that we'll read. Psalm 86. May we feel as the psalmist David felt here, as we contemplate our relationship with God and how we represent that name. Are you there? Psalm 86, verse 11 and 12. Instruct me, O Jehovah, about your way. I shall walk in your truth. Unify my heart to fear your name. I laud you, O Jehovah, my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name to time indefinite. Friends, may we do that. May we sanctify Jehovah's name, and may we never... Never take up Jehovah's name in vain.